I read a story this week about a man who lived in Long Island, New York, and he had as his dream to purchase the world's finest barometer. He found one in the catalog, he sent off for it, and it arrived by Federal Express a couple of uh, days later. But when he opened the box, he was disappointed when he pulled out the barometer to see that the needle was stuck on the section that said hurricane. <laughs> and so he shook the barometer vigorously, but the needle wouldn't move. He was so angry. He sat down and he wrote a scathing letter to the manufacturer. And the next morning, he dropped it off in the mail on his way to work in New York City. When he got back that evening from New York City, you can imagine his surprise when he saw that not only was his barometer missing, but his entire house was missing as well. Long Island had been struck with the worst hurricane in history. You know, the fact is, Daniel chapter 11 is a biblical barometer, and the needle is stuck on a spiritual hurricane that is coming our way. The Bible says there is going to be a spiritual, a political storm that will one day engulf this entire world. And regardless of the changing political situations, the Word of God remains steadfast and certain. And that's what Daniel chapter 11 tells us. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn today to Daniel chapter 11 as we look at what I'm calling the countdown to Armageddon. Daniel 11 not only tells us what is going to happen, but it contains a clear word about how we ought to live today in light of the coming end. And remember in chapter 10, the angel came and appeared to Daniel. He said he had been hindered by a demonic force from coming, but he finally came to give Daniel the final revelation. And the revelation begins in chapter 11. Now, I thought about a way to try to make sense of this to you. And so on your outline, and I want you to follow it, I've divided this chapter into three parts. First of all, Israel's tribulation under Greece. That's verses 1 to 20. And secondly, Israel's tribulation under Antiochus Epiphanes, a Greek ruler. That would be verses 21 to 35. And then Israel's final tribulation under the future ruler known as the Antichrist, that's verses 36 through 45. Why is Israel so important? Because Israel was God's chosen people through which he would reveal himself to the world. God said, I'm going to take the most unlikely nation in all the world, the most undeserving nation, and I'm going to show my power through them. I'm going to show my goodness through this nation of Israel. I'm going to show my ability to keep my promises through the covenant that I make with Israel. Israel was God's appointed representative here on earth. God said, even if Israel turns away from me in unbelief, I will still accomplish my purpose with Israel. And remember, it was through Israel uh, that the world received God's revelation, His commandments at Mount Sinai. It was through Israel that the Holy Scriptures were penned. And it was through Israel, as this choir so wonderfully sang, that the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, came. And it is through Israel that God's final purpose for the world will be accomplished. Look at verse 1. This is the beginning of the angel's message to Daniel. He says, In the first year of Darius the Mede, I, the angel, arose to be an encouragement and a protection for him. Now, to me, that's fascinating. Darius was an unbeliever. He was a pagan, and yet this angel says, Daniel, in the first year of his reign, I was assigned to him. God assigned me to him. I was to be an encouragement to him. You see, God had ordained 150 years earlier that this man named Darius or Cyrus would be the one who would allow Israel to go back to the land just as he had promised. And you know what this passage says to me? It reminds me that God is bigger than anyone in our life. God is powerful enough to even use unbelievers to accomplish his plan for you. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it whichever way he wishes. Uh, this angel said, Darius was in my hand. I was 
raised up to encourage him and use him to accomplish God's purpose. Now, here's what the angel says to Daniel. Now, I will tell you, verse 2, the truth. Behold, three more kings are going to arise in Persia. That is, after Darius, there would be three more Persian kings. And then a fourth will gain far more riches than all of them. As soon as he becomes strong through his riches, he will arouse the whole empire against the realm of Greece. And we know from history that's exactly what happened after Daniel died. There was a fourth Persian king. His name is called Ahasuerus, or sometimes he's known as Xerxes, the king of Persia, the king during the time of Nehemiah. And uh, Xerxes uh, felt emboldened to go ahead and attack Greece. And the only problem was he wasn't successful. The only thing he was successful in doing was angering the Greek people. And eventually, 150 years later, there arose a Greek ruler. And we find him described in verses 3 and 4 who conquered Persia. Look at verse 3. And a mighty king will arise, and he will rule with great authority and do as he pleases. But as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom will be broken up. Who is this Greek leader who came 150 years later? We know him. His name is Alexander the Great. He was a Greek ruler who in just 12 years conquered the entire world. And when he died, the Greek empire, the mighty Greek empire that ruled the world, it was broken up into four pieces. And those four pieces did not go to Alexander's uh, family. We see here in verse 4, this was a prophecy of what would happen. It will be parceled out, verse 4, toward the four points of the compass, though not to his own descendants, nor according to his authority, which he wielded for his sovereignty will be uprooted and given to others besides them. And again, Daniel prophesied this. It's exactly what happened. Now, why does Daniel and the angel spend 15 verses talking about the battle between Syria and between Egypt? Well, think about the geography. You've got Syria in the north. You've got Egypt in the south. What is between Syria and Egypt? Israel. Israel. And that battle that started more than 2,000 years ago, 2,300 years ago, is still raging today. Israel has become the battleground, the center point, the focal point for the conflict in the Middle East. This continuing conflict between Syria and Egypt sets the stage for verses 21 through 35, and that's Israel's tribulation under Antiochus Epiphanes. Look at verse 21, how he came to power. And in his place, in whose place? Well, if you go back to verse 20, he's talking about Seleucus IV, one of the Seleucids. In Seleucus IV's place, a despicable person will arise. That's Antiochus Epiphanes, on whom the honor of kingship has not been conferred. And he will come in a time of tranquility, and he will seize the kingdom by intrigue. I wish I had time to get into it. I don't. But this prophecy, exactly as it's written, came to pass. Antiochus Epiphanes was not a direct descendant of Seleucus. He was able to come to power by intrigue. He had a way of weaseling his way to become the king of Syria. That's a very fascinating story to read. But suffice it to say, he came to power just as the Bible prophesied. Look at verse 22. The overflowing forces will be flooded away before him and shattered and also the prince of the covenant. Now, we saw this in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, where Antiochus Epiphanes is talked about. He would rule over uh, Israel. He would bring persecution against God's people for 2,300 days. Now, look at verse 24. In a time of tranquility, he will enter the richest parts of the realm, and he will accomplish what his fathers never did, nor his ancestors. He will distribute plunder, booty, and possessions among them, and he will devise his schemes against strongholds, but only for a time. This ruler, who is, by the way, a forerunner of the Antichrist, will do what the Antichrist will one day do as well. He will start out his reign immensely popular in the world. And that's true of Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, intoxicated by his growing success, he decides to go after Egypt. And look at verses 25 to 28 that record his defeat of Egypt. Verse 26 says, Those who eat his choice food will destroy the king of Egypt, and his army will overflow, but many will fall sl down slain. Uh, because of disloyalty within the king of Egypt's own uh, ranks, 
Uh, the defeat by Antiochus Epiphanes was relatively easy. Verse 27, as for both kings, talking about the king of Syria and the king of Egypt, their hearts will be intent on evil. And they will speak lies to each other at the same table, that is the peace table. But it will not succeed, for the end is still to come at the appointed time. God has an appointed time. He's going to bring this all to a climax. And it's going to come to a climax not through peace, but through war. So, uh, you have uh, uh, Antiochus temporarily defeating some of Egypt, but not all of Egypt. So, again, feeling good about himself, he decides to launch one more attack against Egypt. But this time, Rome intervened. The Roman em emperor decided he didn't want Antiochus overtaken uh, Egypt. And so as Antiochus' forces marched from Syria in the north through Israel to the border of Egypt, Antiochus and his men were met at the border by a messenger, a senator from Rome named Papalius. We know all of this from secular history. And Papalius, the Roman senator, said, I have a message for you from the emperor. Turn around and go back home. Do not invade Egypt. And Antiochus Epiphanes was so humiliated by this Roman messenger that he turned around and he marched back to his home in Syria. But on his way to Syria, he had to pass through where? Israel. And he unleashes an unrelenting assault upon God's people. And that's what begins these 2,300 days of persecution against Israel. One of the many things Antiochus did against Israel was to take a swine and alter it on the uh, altar, offer it on the altar of the temple in Jerusalem. And then he took the temple in Jerusalem and dedicated it to the pagan god Zeus. And then he, he began killing God's people uh, without mercy. Now look at verse 35. Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end of time. Underline that. Because it is still to come. Underline that at the appointed time. The angel gave Daniel the reason these terrible persecutions were going to happen to Israel. It's not because God hated Israel. It's not because God had rejected Israel. It's because God loved Israel. And that leads to the final section of Daniel. And that is Israel's final tribulation under the Antichrist. Now remember, when Daniel wrote these prophecies, when he took the prophecy down, it was 538 B.C. And he was looking forward 400 years to something that would go to 165 B.C. Now, in, Daniel's, in Daniel living in 538 B.C., as he looked down, all of the prophecies... All, the, all of chapter 11 was still future. But now here we are living in the 21st century, and we look back on the first 35 verses. And stay with me on this. In the first 35 verses of Daniel 11, there are 135 specific prophecies about Israel, about Egypt, about Greece, about Persia. 135 specific prophecies, and every one of them has been fulfilled. Every one of them. Now, when we get to verse 36, it's obvious. From our vantage point, we're not looking back at what's already happened. We're looking forward to something that is still to come. The final seven years of tribulation that will result in the return of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice the four characteristics of this future world leader who will be the one responsible for the final tribulation that Israel and all of the world will experience. Now, the first characteristic of the Antichrist is he will blaspheme the name of the true God. Look at verse 36. Then the king will do as he pleases, and he will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will speak monstrous things against the God of gods. And he will prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. Now that phrase, speak monstrous things against the God of gods, that's what the word blaspheme means. It means to strike against. It means to speak against God. 
And that's what this final world leader will do. He will say horrible things about God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And people will just accept it for what it is. Secondly, He will magnify His own name, verse 37 says. He will show no regard for the gods of His Father or for the desire of women, nor will He show regard for any other god, for He will magnify Himself above them all. In the end times, there will be such a desire for a political leader who can bring peace in this chaotic world. There will be such a desire for anybody who can put an end to the fiscal crisis that the whole world will be experiencing at that time, that anyone who is able to do that will be worshipped as the Lord and Savior. That's what it says about the coming of the Antichrist. That is how he is going to be able to uh, elevate himself above God without any revolt at all except from the remnant. Thirdly, he will place his faith in military might. He will place his faith in military might. Look at verses 38 and 39. But instead of worshiping the true God, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones, and treasures. Is he talking about a specific God that this Antichrist will worship? No. What he's saying is he will put his faith in military power. He will want to acquire military power in a way none of his predecessors ever had it. And he will spend an inordinate amount of the world's resources to acquire those powers. The final characteristic of the Antichrist is found in verses 40 to 45. He will battle against the nations. Look at verse 40. And the end, at the end of time, the king of the south will collide with him. And the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. And he will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. And he will also enter the beautiful land. That's Israel. And many countries will fall. I don't have time to explain all of this, but let me give you the capsulized version of it. Remember, when the Antichrist comes to power, he does so as the head of a ten-nation confederacy over which he presides. But during the last three and a half years of that seven-year period, God is raining down his judgment on the earth. And these other kings of the other nations are growing weary of living under the tyranny of the Antichrist. And so they plot to overthrow him. And they make several attempts to overthrow the Antichrist. Now look down at verses uh, 44 and 45. But rumors from the east and from the north will disturb this ruler, the Antichrist, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. The Antichrist will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the two seas, that is the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea and the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. The Bible says that that final world conflict will center at the plain of Megiddo. Revelation 16 says the demonic forces will lure all the kings of the world to the place of that last great battle. They have come to do war against Antichrist. He has come to destroy all of his opposition. And yet as they begin to fight one another, to their surprise, the clouds will part. The Lord Jesus Christ appears. That is the end of the great world leader, Antichrist, just as Daniel prophesied. What is the application of this? Application is very, very simple. The first 35 verses of Daniel 11 contain 135 prophecies that have all been fulfilled. Verses 36 through 45 contain a few more prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. Is there anyone here who doubts that the same God who has already fulfilled those 135 prophecies is going to fulfill the final remaining prophecies about the return of Jesus Christ? The end is certain. And as verse 27 says, it will come at the appointed time. God has a calendar, and nothing changes that calendar what appears to be chaos that we hear about on the news and read in the newspapers, Syria, Egypt, Israel, Iran, what appears to be meaningless chaos is all a part of God's plan that will precede the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is going to bring every one of those events to come at His appointed time. God is in control of what's happening in the world. 
He's in control of what's happening in your life as well. There is an appointed time for everything that happens to you. But if there's one thought I want to leave you with today, it's this. As interesting as all of this is, as Christians, what we're looking for is not the Antichrist. We're looking for the return of Jesus Christ. That's what our hope is. Daniel chapter 10 is one of those rare instances in which God allows us to peek behind uh, the curtain of the visible world and see those invisible forces that are controlling not only what is happening in the headlines every day, but the things, the struggles, the opposition you're facing in your life as well. And it's that invisible war we're going to see demonstrated today. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. We're coming to the final vision, chapters 10, 11, and 12. Now, the actual vision, which is the most dramatic of all of the visions, doesn't actually come until chapters 11 and 12. But when we come to chapter 10, we find the preamble to that vision. I heard one noted Bible expositor say, there is nothing he could find at all in Daniel chapter 10 worth preaching about. I beg to differ. All scriptures inspired by God, and it's all profitable. And all I had to do was read this through once and see immediately the great application for us in our own lives, as well as in God's plan and program for the future. Now, let's look at chapter 10, beginning with verse 1, when we see Daniel receiving a heavenly visitor. Look at verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. Remember, that was his name given by Nebuchadnezzar. And the message was true and one of great conflict, but he had understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. Now, this gives us the time that this vision came to Daniel. It was in the third year of the reign of Cyrus, or sometimes known as Darius. Remember, in the first year of Cyrus's reign, Cyrus told the people they could begin to go back to Jerusalem. And this was a fulfillment of the prophecy Isaiah had made 150 years earlier before Cyrus was even born. Now we're in the third year, two years afterwards, God reveals this vision to Daniel. What had happened by the time Daniel received this vision, about 43,000 of the Israelites had gone back to Jerusalem. Amazingly, many chose to stay in Babylon. They had become so comfortable in that pagan lifestyle that when they gave, had the opportunity to leave, they said, no, we'll stay where we are. And that caused great distress to Daniel. We'll see why. Look at verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. For three weeks, he mourned, he prayed, and he fasted. Why was he so distressed? Now, he was distressed over several things. God had apparently fulfilled this prophecy to allow the Jews to go back, and yet so few Jews were actually going back. And then he heard a report, we'll find later in the chapter, that says the progress on the temple, rebuilding the temple, is not going well. There were so few Jews who had returned back to Jerusalem, but the progress on rebuilding the temple was slowed. And not only that, we find out that it took seven months just to clear the rubble of the temple that had been burned down by Nebuchadnezzar. So it looked like that God was not going to be able to fulfill his promise. And Daniel was discouraged. Have you ever come to that place in your life where you felt like God had told you something? God had promised you something? But now things weren't working out like you thought they ought to. You pray and you pray and something just seems not right. It seems like God is not answering uh, his promise to you. That's how Daniel felt. And so he spent an extended, extended period of time in prayer and fasting. And Daniel was discouraged. He didn't know if God was going to fulfill this promise or not. And so look, look what happened. He received a heavenly visitor. Look at beginning in verse 5. I lifted up my eyes. Remember, he's in the midst of this time of prayer and fasting. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold, a new faz. 
His body was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and his feet, the gleam of polished bronze. And the sound of his words were like the sound of a tumult. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great dread fell on them, and they ran away to hide uh, for themselves. Now what was it that Daniel saw? Who was it that Daniel saw that caused such dread and later left Daniel almost lifeless? Well, from the description, it's very clear whom Daniel saw. And if you don't have it in mind yet, Turn over to Revelation chapter 1, beginning with verse 12. Revelation 1, beginning with verse 12. Look at this description. Remember, John had been exiled to the island of Patmos. And he was there because he refused to bow down before the emperor. And it was there while he was on, in exile on Patmos that somebody appeared to him. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at the description in verse 12. John says, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it had been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. Now look at verse 16. In his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Verse 19, therefore write the things which you have seen, the things which are, the things which shall take place after these things. That's an outline right there of the book of Revelation. And then he says in verse 20, as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And the reason Jesus appeared to John at Patmos was to encourage him that he was still in control. And that's the reason that God, Jesus appeared to Daniel earlier 500 years earlier he said i'm getting ready to show you a vision of things you're not going to completely understand they're frightening but know that i am in control ladies and gentlemen do you have that assurance do you know god is in control of your life and that's why jesus appeared to the prophet daniel here now look at verses eight and nine he says so i was left alone and i saw this great vision Yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. This is what happens when somebody comes face to face with God. You know, when you really come face to face with God, you can't help but tremble and fall to your knees. Remember the story of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah saw that vision of the Lord high and lifted up, the train of his robe filling the temple, the angels flying around singing, holy, holy, holy. What did Isaiah do? He fell to his feet and said, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. None of us is worthy to stand in the presence of God. John wasn't, Daniel wasn't, we aren't. The Bible says we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. It is only when we wrap ourselves in the righteousness of Jesus Christ that we are worthy to stand in his presence. So what happened? Look in verses 10 to 21. He had just seen a vision of the resurrected Christ. Now God sends a heavenly helper to help Daniel as well as reveal the vision to him of the future. Look at verse 10. Then behold, a man touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I am about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Now I want you to underline the phrase in verse 11, 
man of high esteem. This is a phrase that is used repeatedly to describe Daniel. And specifically, it is how God viewed Daniel. He thought of him as a man worthy of esteem. Now look at verse 12, the helper's conflict. Then the angel said to me, now he's not named. Some people think he's Gabriel. I don't think it's Gabriel because Gabriel was named uh, a, a few chapters before. It's an unseen angel, but it's a good angel. Then this angel said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. Now, how long had Daniel been praying? Verse 2 says he's been praying for three weeks, for 21 days. The angel said, now I want you to know, as soon as I heard, God sent me to answer your prayer. But notice verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. How long is that? Three weeks. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. In other words... This good angel said, you probably wondered why I didn't come earlier. I was on my way the moment you started praying. But I was hindered for three weeks from coming because of the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And I was thwarted from coming until finally Michael, who later in chapter 12 is identified as the defender of Israel, until Michael came and cleared the way for me to be able to come. Now, the question is, in verse 13, who is the prince of the kingdom of Persia that could keep an angel from coming to Daniel? Now, obviously, this is not a human prince. No human being could stop an angel. The Old Testament tells us uh, of an occasion in which one angel killed 186,000 Assyrian soldiers. So no human being is going to be able to stop an angel. It's very clear here that the prince of the kingdom of Persia is a demon. A fallen angel that did heavenly battle against this good angel who was attempting to answer Daniel's prayer. This verse reminds us that there is an unseen but very real war going on between nations as well as in our own hearts as well. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the uh, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. The Bible says there is an unseen but real war going on, and this war is going to especially manifest itself in future attacks against Israel. What I'm saying to you is throughout history, all of the attacks against Israel have been demonically inspired. And the reason is Satan has a special interest in wiping Israel off the face of the earth. Because if he can do that, if he can accomplish that, he can negate the promise that God has made to take care of Israel. He can discredit Almighty God. God has not made a promise to take care of any other nation in the world. You understand that, don't you? No nation has ever been promised that it will survive until the end time. America has not received that promise. Uh, uh, Greece has not received that promise. Egypt has not received that promise. Only Israel has been promised that she will survive until the end. And so Satan wants to do everything he can to discredit God's uh, uh, purpose. And that's why since the beginning of Israel's day, uh, satanically inspired leaders have tried to destroy Israel and keep God from fulfilling his purpose. Look in the past at Pharaoh, or look at Herod, or look at Antiochus Epiphanes that we talked about or look at Adolf Hitler. And let me just say this. We're going to see next week in chapter 12 that were it not for Michael the archangel who is called the defender of Israel, had it not been for Michael the archangel, Israel would have been destroyed. And were it not for Michael who will take his stand at the end of time, Israel would be destroyed under the Antichrist. But God has given Israel Michael to be her defender and that says something to me very, very clearly. Any nation that opposes Israel is on the losing side because they are opposing the plan of Almighty God himself. 
and we need to remember that as a nation. God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. I believe right now, behind the Chinese government that is persecuting millions of Christians, behind the human leaders of China, there is a demonic force that is inspiring the persecution of God's people. And in the last day, there will be a human leader, the Antichrist, who will be demonically inspired to try and destroy Israel. Now, that's the vision that Daniel saw. Look at verse 14. Now, uh, this good angel said, I was coming. I wanted to deliver this a message to you, but I was prevented from doing so by the demon, the prince of Persia. But look at verse 14. But now have I come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the days yet future. As you've heard before, there are those who say all of the book of Daniel, all of the book of Revelation have already been fulfilled. It's just history. No, the Bible says this is yet future. It is yet to come. And look at verse 20. Then he said, the angel said, do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I am going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth. Yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. The good angel says, Daniel, I'm going to reveal this to you, but I'm going back to do battle with the demon, the prince of Persia, and the one who is leading Greece as well. You know what that says to me? It says to me, spiritual warfare is never over. There's never a time you and I can relax and say, we've succeeded, we're victorious. The Bible says we will fight against the spiritual forces of darkness until the day the Lord returns for us. Ephesians six twelve again says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You've heard me say before that word struggle is the Greek word pale. It refers to a wrestling match in the Greek times. It was a life and death match. Whoever lost the wrestling match would have his eyes gouged out first and then be executed. The Bible says that is the kind of struggle you and I are engaged in right now. Our struggle is not against other people. Your struggle is not against that obstinate boss you work for. It's not against that unloving and uncaring mate. Your struggle is not with that rebellious child who won't obey you or God, no. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the heavenly forces of wickedness in the high places. And that's why if we're going to win this battle, we have to put on the full armor of God. I want you to imagine for just a moment, you're driving home one evening at dusk. You're listening to the news on the radio and you hear a news report that a lion has escaped the local zoo, and it was last seen roaming up and down the streets of your neighborhood. As you pulled into your driveway, before you got out of your car, don't you imagine you might look around? Your eyes might dart back and forth to see if there's any movement in the shadows at all, and only when you were felt it was okay, you would run into your home, and yet you really wouldn't feel safe until that lion had been apprehended. Ladies and gentlemen, a lion has been loosed. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert, for your adversary, the devil, roams about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Make no mistake about it, Satan is after you. He has a blueprint for your destruction that includes the defilement of your conscience, dividing your family, destroying your relationship with God, and he will not give up until he has succeeded. Daniel 10 is a reminder of that invisible but very real war that is going on in your life. Ephesians 6 reminds us that our only hope for winning that battle 
is to put on the full armor of God. Paul wrote, finally, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you might be able to stand firm against the schemes, the methodia, the blueprint for destruction of the evil.